Chapter 17 of The Beggar, Arius, and Other Things This same afternoon there came a beggar from the town, whom the young men called Arius, because he carried messages for them, giving him this name because it was Iris who takes the messages of the gods. This fellow was very stout and tall, and a mighty man to eat and drink, but he was a coward. When he saw Odysseus sitting at the door of the palace, he said, Old man, get away from this place, or I will drag you from it. The young men would like me to do so now, but I think it is a shame to strike an old man. Odysseus said, There's room here for you and me. Get what you can, I do not grudge it to you, but do not make me angry, lest I should hurt you. But Iris thought to himself, Here is a man who I can easily get the better of. And he said, Get away from your place, or else fight with me. Antoninus heard what he said, and he called to the suitors and said, Here is a good sport, the best that I have ever seen in this place. There are two beggars are going to fight. Come, my friends, and let us make a match between them. Then the young men got up from their seats to join in the sport, and Antoninus said, Here are two haunches of goats. We should have had them for supper. Now, if these two beggars will fight... We will give the conqueror one of the haunches for his own supper, and he shall eat it with us, and he shall always have a place kept for him. Odysseus said, It is a hard thing for an old man to fight with a young one. Still, I am ready. Only you must all swear that you will not give me a foul blow while I am fighting with this fellow. Telemachus said, That shall be so, old man. And all the suitors agreed. Then Odysseus made himself ready to fight, and when the suitors saw his thighs, were strong and thick they were, and how broad his shoulders and what mighty arms he had, they said to each other, This is a strong fellow. There will be little left of Iris when the fight is over. As for Iris, when he saw the old beggar stripped, he was terribly afraid, and he would have slunk away, but the young men would not suffer it. Antinia said, how is this, Iris, that you're afraid of an old beggar? If you play the coward, you shall be put into a ship and taken to King Echetus, who will cut off your ears and your nose and give them to his dogs. As the two men stood up to fight, and Odysseus thought to himself, Shall I kill this fellow with a blow, or shall I be content with knocking him down? And this last seemed to be the better thing to do. First Iris struck Odysseus, but did not hurt him with his blow. Then Odysseus struck Iris, and the blow was on the man's jawbone, and Iris fell to the ground, and the blood poured out of his mouth. And Odysseus dragged him out of the hall, and propped him against the wall of the courtyard, and put a staff in his hand, and said, Sit there, and keep away, dogs and swine, from coming in at the door. Do not try to lord it over men, no, not even over strangers and beggars, lest some worse thing should happen to you. And Antinous gave Odysseus the goat his haunch, and another of the suitors, whose name was Ampinanus, took two loaves from the table and gave them to him, and he gave him a cup of wine, and himself drank his health, saying, Good luck to you, father, hereafter, for now you seem to have fallen of evil days. And Odysseus had a liking for the young man, knowing that he was better than his fellows, and he tried to give him a warning, so he said, you have some wisdom, and your father, I know, is a wise man. Now listen to me. There is nothing in the world so foolish as a man. When he is prosperous, he thinks there is no evil will come near him. But when the gods send evil, and he can do nothing to help himself, look at me, when I was prosperous, I trusted in myself and in my king's folk, and see where I am now. Trust not in robbery and wrong, for the gods will punish such things sooner or later. You and your fellows here are doing wrong to one who is absent, but he will come back some day and slay his enemies. Fly, therefore, while there is still time, and be not here to meet him when he comes. So Odysseus spoke, meaning to be kind to the man, and the man felt in his heart that these words were true. Nevertheless, he went on in the same way, for his doom was upon him that he should die. And now Athena put into the heart of Penelope that she should show herself to the suitors, and this the goddess did for this reason. 
first that the hearts of the young men should be still more lifted up in them with pride and folly and next that they should be moved to give gifts to the queen as will be seen and thirdly that the queen might be more honoured by her husband and her son. So Penelope said to the old woman that waited on her, I have a desire now for the first time to show myself to the suitors, though they are quite as hateful to me as before. Also, I would say a word to my son, lest he should have too much to do with these wicked men, and they should do him some harm. The old woman said, This is well thought, lady. Go and show yourself to the suitors, and speak to your son. But first wash and anoint your face. Do not let the tears be seen on your cheeks. It is not well to be always grieving. The queen said, Do not talk to me about washing and anointing my face. What do I care how I look, now that my husband is gone? But tell two of my maids to come with me, for I would not go among these men alone. So the old woman went to tell the maids, but Athena would not let the queen have her own way in this matter. So she caused a deep sleep to fall upon her, and while she slept she made her more beautiful and taller than she was before. When the queen awoke, she said to herself, Oh, that I might die without pain, just as now I have fallen asleep, for what good is my life to me now that my husband is gone? Then she got up from her bed and washed her face and went down to the hall and stood in the door with a maid standing on either side of her. Never was there a more beautiful woman. Every one of the suitors prayed in his heart that he might have her for his wife. When she spoke to her son, Telemachus, when you were a child you had ready wit, but now that you are a grown-up, though you are such to look at as your king's son should be, tall and fair, yet your thoughts seem to go astray. What is this that has now been done in this house, this ill-treating a stranger? It would be a shame to us for ever if he should be hurt. Telemachus answered, You do well to be angry, my mother. Nevertheless, I am not to blame. I cannot have all things as I could wish them to be, for others are stronger than I am, and will have their way. But as for this fight between the stranger Iris, it did not end as the suitors would have had it. The stranger had better of him, and Iris now sits by the gate, wagging his head and cannot raise himself on his feet. The stranger has taken all the strength out of him. I wish in my heart that all the suitors were in as evil case as he. Then said one of the suitors to Penelope, O oh queen, if all the Greeks could behold you, there would be such a crowd in this hall tomorrow as never has seen so fair. So fair are you above all the women in the land. Penelope said, Do not talk to me of beauty. My beauty departed when my lord Odysseus went to Troy. If only he would return, then it would be well with me. I remember how, when he departed, he took me by the hand and said, O oh lady, not all the Greeks that go this day to Troy will come back, for the men of Troy, they say, are great spearmen, and skilled in shooting the bow, and good drivers of chariots, and so I know not whether I shall come back to my home, or perish there before the walls of the city. Do thou therefore care for my father and for my mother while I am away, care for them as you do now, and even more and bring up my son Telemachus, and when he is a bearded man, then, if I am dead, marry whom you will. So my husband spoke, and now the time is come, for he is dead, for it is ten years since Troy was taken, and yet he has not come back, and Telemachus is grown to be a man, and I am constrained to make another marriage, although I am unhappy, and have yet another trouble. My suitors are not as the suitors of other women, for the custom is that when a man would woo a work lady, he brings sheep and oxen and makes a feast for the kindred and friends. But these men devour my substance and make no payment for it. So spoke the queen, and Odysseus was glad to see how she beguiled, beguiled the men, drawing gifts from them while she hated them in her heart. Then said Antinous, Lady, we'll give you gifts, not will you do well, refuse them. But know this, that we will not depart from this place till you have chosen one of us for your husband. To 
this all the suitors agreed, and every man sent his squire to fetch his gift. Antonius gave up an embroidered robe, very handsome, with twelve brooches and twelve clasps of gold on it. Another gave a chain of curious work, with beads of amber. A third a pair of earrings, and yet another a very precious jewel. Everyone gave a gift, so the queen went back to her chamber. Then said one of the suitors to his fellows, scoffing at the stranger, See now our good luck, and that the gods have sent this man to us. How does the light of the torches flash on his bald head? And he turned to Odysseus and said, Stranger, will you serve me as a hired servant of my farm among the hills? Your wages will be sure, and you shall work, gathering stones, and building walls, and planting trees, and you shall have clothes, and shoes for your feet, and bread to eat. But you do not care, I take it, to work in the fields. You'd like better to beg your bread and do not go and to do no work. Odysseus answered, Young man, I would gladly take my strength against yours. We too might each take a scythe in his hand and mow grass when the days grow long in the spring, fasting meanwhile, or we might plough against each other, driving teams of oxen in the field of four acres. Then you should see whether I could plough a clean and straight furrow, or a so should order, would that you and I might stand together in the front rank? You think over much of yourself, but verily, if Odysseus should come back, this door would not be wide enough for you and your fellows to escape. The man was very angry to hear such words. Old man, he cried, you had better not say such things, lest I do you mischief. Has your wine stolen away your wits? Or is it your way to parade this idle fashion? Or are you puffed up by having your better of Iris the beggar? And he caught up a footstool and threw it at Odysseus. But Odysseus stooped down and escaped it. But the footstool struck a young man who was carrying around the wine and hurt his hand so grievously that he fell back and lay on the floor groaning. Then said one of the suitors to his neighbour, I wish this fellow would go away. Ever since he came hither there has been strife and quarrelling in want the place. Now we shall have no more pleasure in the feast. But Telemachus said, It is plain that you have meat and drink. Enough, now let us all go to rest. And they agreed and went away. <laughs>